gentlemen, the 1230 Super Shuttle flight is now ready. The passengers, please come forward. There he is. Oh, <laughs> my goodness me. How it's good to see you. And you. I haven't changed a bit. No, as soon as I believe ever. You mustn't say nasty things like that. <laughs> You're not talking about me, are you? <laughs> I'm good to see you. And you. Good hands. Hello. These men were among the first soldiers to go into action when the Northern Ireland Troubles began in 1969. Now, they're going back to Belfast. Did the Augie country looking well? Yeah, it's still doing well, How are you? Yeah, and how's the civilian life? Ah, shooting me quite well. Yeah, two of us having to cope. Yes. What a reunion, though, isn't it? It could be tricky. It could be very tricky. It started about two hours ago. What are they throwing you out for, anyway? Undiscovered crimes this time. David Hancock. In 1968, he was the commander of A Company, 1st Light Infantry. Mike Sawyer was a sergeant in A Company in 1968. Bill Stevenson, also a sergeant in A Company. Chris Matthews, a corporal, A Company. And Chris Bishop, a corporal, A Company, the first soldier to open fire in these troubles. All five do other jobs now in England. But a few weeks ago, they returned to Northern Ireland to meet today's soldiers and remember the time they were first posted, just before the bombings began. Yeah, but these. Yeah. But we never used to come this far out of Belfast, didn't we? But if you, if you look at. What are you doing? Put that location on you, please. Yes, very much. He was called back. Thank you very much. His parents are separated. And you're coming from. From the airport. Going to. Belfast. Belfast. That's fine. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. See, they're carrying uh, M1s and M1s, M2s. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. And um, the first time I saw those was with the Somerset Light Infantry in the Malayan emergency. We gave up. Down, down an alleyway here, turn right, and he was killed in the alleyway. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Jack, that was not Jack Rickman, that was the boxer, his brother. Uh, and he died um, as a result of the bullet. Him, down there. Couldn't get his flak jacket off. Uh, but this used to be the interface. This Holy Cross school yeah. here. This, this Holy Cross going here. into yeah. there. This stretch here now, <clears throat> down here, and it was around about here that gunner got killed. That's where yeah. this was my patch. Yeah, it's not and changed much. <laughs> and I was the intelligence sign. Oh, 27 lift, lift ups in there. First man in. Yeah. And I think I've probably been there for 10 years. And this one used to be houses. Really? Yeah. Yeah. They, they lived in those, Chris. Yeah. We used to live in there. They're the toilets, remember? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. The underground toilets just there. Yeah. Yeah. Flax Mill. Oh, Flax Mill. Yeah. Yeah. This is the airport. This is Leopold Street. Look at it. memory of this street are the orange marches coming down here on July the 12th. And you wait at the bottom because of the escort duties, and you hear the bands. Yes. And then you see see the bowler hats coming over the brow of the hill. And the colours yeah. and uh, the, the Loyal Orange Lodge uh, paraphernalia. Uh, and, and, uh, and away they come, the, the whole road packed with Orangemen going off for their for their day. Can you remember that screen we had to put between the Orangemen yes, and I do. the yeah. other march Huge coming the other way? Hessian screen. That's right. Put it on block the side of four tunners. That's right. That's right. But so it was the apprehend you knew it was going to happen. Right. Yeah. And over would come a stone, then a bottle, and off they went. Yes. And they would always insist on coming up here and going through that interface on opposite the Ardoing right. and going then back down the Shank Hill. Yes. The interesting thing, though, coming back is to see coming back to Belfast now is to the astonishing resilience of this city. Oh, because yeah. you think, what, since 1968, it's been blown up, people have been yeah. killed, there have been crowd problems, and yet look at it, the citizens the are still going on with their business. Mm -hmm. It's a hell of a resilient mm -hmm. place, you know. Oh, they, yes. They've got a lot of uh, toughness and stamina yeah. to yeah. keep their lives going, despite <laughs> these oh, terrible things the around them. Stop at any traffic lights. <laughs> I feel a bit naked without a firearm. Yeah, that yes. is an unusual feeling. I've, uh, yes. I mentioned that There's too. something missing. <clears throat> and I, I think that's what it is, but we haven't got anything to protect ourselves.
this is the LVH, yeah. Falls, yeah. Falls Grosvenor yeah. Junction. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the park here is where a lot of knee cabins went on in the last tour yeah. of the unit. Never travel in Belfast like this, no. would you? I mean, you wouldn't have so many people in such a tight vehicle. No, that's correct. The, the loss would be too great. Regarded as um, as a considerable perk to come it to was, yes, Alec, in there. Yeah. because not only did you have your private beach, but the countryside round very beautiful, yes. and you could the, you could get to so many nice places from yeah. there. And uh, although we'd heard rumblings of civil rights marches and that sort of thing before we came, no one gave a thought to our being involved in it. It was something that would concern other people. We were coming to come to a lovely place and have an enjoyable, happy battalion posting. Almost in the first month that we arrived, there were one or two incidents in Nuri and Armagh, and perhaps a couple in Derry. The Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association was having the odd street protest, the odd meeting about some of the... Uh, they produced a five-point plan to try and move towards the kind of democratic environment that we enjoyed on, in Great Britain. And I remember being astonished that they should even need to produce a five-point plan because some of the points on it, for example, uh, in local uh, elections, only ratepayers could vote here. Well, that surprised me. I thought those days had gone. But it, I, we gradually <laughs> learned that although Northern Ireland was uh, constitutionally part of the United Kingdom, the rules here were a little bit different. <laughs> I couldn't believe that it wasn't one man, one vote. I, you know, I, I just didn't believe that when they said it. Yes, and uh, this is what they were fighting for. And I, f I really felt for the Roman Catholic community. Because at that time I thought, you know, the Roman Catholics are getting a hard time. Mm. Why can't they be like any other person in, in England? So and the word it, civil it, liberties brought on a whole new meaning because you didn't realise that people didn't have the liberties that we had in Cornwall or Durham. That's right. Everybody was equal there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I and mean, the even the immigrant and had the same here. liberties as us. But you came here and there were people who did not have the same liberties as the person in the next street. And they had to live in a certain area of the town because somebody in the past had said that that was where the boundaries would be and Protestant will live that side of the street and Catholic will live that so side of the street. Basically, they were second-class citizens. There's no two words about that. Yeah. And that's gone on for years, hundreds of years. And until, until 1968, 69, uh, the problem, uh, they'd been repressed all the time by the management of the country. If you went for a job, I mean, 99% of the time, the first question was where you live, because that would tell them what religion you were and whether you were going to get the job or not. You know, I mean, things that are unbelievable. Exactly. Having to find out what the word Fenian meant. That's right. Yeah. And the word <laughs> Tay. Tay. Yeah. 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 And words that were totally alien to us. We'd never heard them before. Yeah. And, you know, somebody said he's a Fenian. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. pardon? Yeah. Watch out! Watch out! to see people trading on automatic weapons in a situation like this, because the chances of you being able to fire them... Yeah, uh, very few and far between. Yeah, very few and far between. And I can remember um, in the Shankill conflict the question of you can fire single shots. Yeah. But although there was heavy automatic fire coming towards us, yeah. at no stage was there any question of us being able to return automatic fire with automatic fire. Yeah. Single shots every time. Well, that's one wall of that shoes, okay? Okay, a little bit more again.
been about December 68 because of our lack of feel for what we should be training, what we should be doing, how we should be briefing our soldiers on the growing uh, emergency situation. We, we had this meeting here, uh, an officer's day, a study day with the IUC, with the general staff, um, but mainly for our own, the benefit of our own officers and senior NCOs. And uh, the IUC briefed us on the last uh, IRA campaign of the 50s. There was no mention of the recent um, uh, civil rights activity. And the, there was, it was a pretty bland discussion about um, uh, internal security in general, the principles of the thing. But the, my outstanding memory of that day in this very building was a statement by the GOC at the time, General Tommy Harris, who was himself an Ulsterman, uh, in summing up and in answering a question about what our future role might be, use these words. I can foresee no situation developing in Northern Ireland in which British soldiers will be deployed on the streets in the Batten and Shield Row. Now that astounded me. Um, every day to me there was the evidence of the inevitable commitment of British soldiers on the streets, even in a crowd control uh, mode. And for that statement to be made, made me feel that somebody was out of touch. This battle is the old battle which our forefathers fought at Derry, Ockram, Enniskill, and the Boy. The, the Paisleyites at that time were extremely active, and it's easy to forget that now. A lot of time and enormous human tragedy has happened since then. But in, when we first came, the Paisleyite activity was everywhere, and uh, the influence of Paisley was considerable. Not just his influence on the people who were prepared to take to the streets and support him, but it seemed to us also the politicians of that day. He could influence whether O'Neill was successful or not, whether Faulkner stayed or went, and so on. There was an, an influence at ground roots level and at the top. We have done violence to no man, but we have sought by all constitutional means to defend what we believe is our right and our wonderful liberties which we have as Protestants. We've been training for three or four months, um, not really knowing what was going to happen. We, we thought something was going to happen, we didn't know what or where. And in April 1969, bang, an almighty explosion. And we, at that time, were in Valley Kindler at home. We didn't know what the explosion was. We found out the next day because we were deployed. We came up and... Down over at the bottom there, a twisted wreckage, a massive pipes blown out of the ground. The shockwave travelled underground and took the roof off this building up here. It was a massive explosion. Of course, in the early stages, we didn't realise that uh, it was a Protestant uh, organisation that, that committed the offence here, and we were led to believe that it was an IRA uprising that had begun. I think the Protestants carried out what they did here because they felt that if they didn't do something to shake the government and, and the heads of state, that they would lose the power that they had in the country at that time. You then, I think within a few months, had 6,000 troops in, in the province committed to the conflict. But I don't think we realised, I certainly didn't realise at that time, Colonel, that we were going to be here for such a long time, not, not as a, a company, but for the British Army to be here for what, 14, 15 years? That's right. Over 2,000 killed? No. The best part of 3,000 3, people dead. Yeah. Yeah. A Hancock had 
uh, got the company on parade and he had said, right, I want you to go home or go back to your back room and pack your kit for a weekend, three or four days at the most. We're going into, into the city uh, to assist. Seven weeks later, we came back and you just worked and slept on the streets. And the families had to cope with this as best they could. When I came down here to Hastings Street uh, Police Station in September 69, I was the company commander responsible for this uh, operational area. And I went to the special branch man and pestered him so much about information because I needed to know that he said to me one night when he was going home, well, there are two cabinets. That's all we've got on the Republican uh, threat. Help yourself. And when I'd finished, uh, and knowing that most of the reason for us being deployed was loyalist aggression against Catholic areas, I said to him, OK, that's the information and intelligence on the Republican side. What about the UVF? And he looked at me with a astonishment, and he said, what UVF? There is no UVF. There is no intelligence. We're not watching them. And I was so astounded by this that I decided to set up to do it myself. But what was worrying, that there seemed to be no, nothing coming out of them. There was no action in order to see them through. And we were getting good, hard intelligence. For example, arms coming off fishing fleets, being landed at a certain port, going into a certain car, and we had the number plate, and on it was going. And my own disquiet was increased when I later discovered, initially from a Republican source, and this was confirmed from my own inquiries, that the general at that time was actually a member of an Orange Lodge, which, uh, I, which flabbergasted me. Push forward and reinforce from behind. When we sort of drove in, back down into a safer area, there was the jokes and, and the quips coming out, you know, and the Mickey taking on the transport. And then we sort of got off the transport, and it sort of quietened down a bit. And then sort of people sort of said, "Is that gunfire, Corporal?" You know, I said, "Yep, that's gunfire, son." The battle of the Shankill Road lasted for more than eight hours. It started around 10 o'clock at night, when a crowd of Protestants advanced on a line of police. The Protestants, first of all, tried to force their way through. The police line held. Then a car was used as a battering ram. The police line gave way, but later the police reformed. Tear gas was used, and it was after that that the first shots were heard. A policeman was hit by one of these shots and killed, and it was then that the army moved into action. <laughs> what we mustn't forget is that we as British troops were moving up this street under gunfire that was coming from an area where all we could see was a sea of Union Jacks silhouetted in the fires of the burn, the burning vehicles and the buildings. And they were singing, God save the Queen. And these people were firing at us. We could see not a man, but a flash of gunfire from the, the chimneys on the right-hand side, the, the roughly the third, fourth chimney along. Uh, on identifying the target, we, I opened fire. There are times when I sat there and thought to myself, well, I shot the first man in Northern Ireland, and um, wondered whether mor morally this was right or wrong, even though I was a soldier at the time. This was the first time that serious gun battles took place, and it was Protestants or extreme Unionists against the British Army. And it's easy to forget that. This was the first serious gun battle of these current troubles. And uh, from then on, we were expecting to be shot at. We were expecting to be employed much more as soldiers. By the time that we had we had come into the confrontation on the night of the 11th, 12th of October, 
your people had successfully, by that time, pushed the RUC off the streets, pushed the other units of the British Army that were here off the streets, and then we were called in, and we fired in return to your fire. You were the first ones to open fire on us. The people on the Shagal Road will, 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 will obviously say different. They'll say that the British Army, that, that a few green young men who found themselves in a precarious position opened fire. Well, perhaps, I was six. You see, I was... They may not be blamed for it, but we will contend that that's right. exactly what happened on the night and that, that there was no gunfire returned on the Shagal Road until, oh, quite a few minutes after see, the initial gunfire. The first shot that I can recollect on the Shankill Road is when Constable Arbuckle was shot. I was six feet away from him and no British soldier shot, soldier shot him. It went very deep when Constable Arbuckle was killed. Uh, people felt a great deal of bewilderment the next day that, that here we had the heart of the empire as, as the loyalist people on the Shankill Road liked to call, or liked to call this particular area. And here we had a policeman dead and soldiers firing on the shankle. Do you not feel that, to some extent, you and, and the Protestants of the Shankle Road were partly responsible for that by being the first ones to fire on the troops? To say that we were responsible for what has... solely responsible for what has, has gone on since, I, I would have to refute, obviously. Uh, we felt... We knew in 1969 that it wouldn't be too long before the IRA raised its ugly head again. We knew that when the B-Specials were being disbanded, that our intelligence network, and that's exactly what, what, what they were, was being taken away, and we would not know what was happening in the, the big Republican areas. My personal feeling is that, you know, after going into the Republican areas, where we, we should not have been accepted, but we were, yes. with, with open arms mm -hmm. and cups of tea, and we developed friendships. And I mean, I got a personal experience of it. Just before my first son was born, I got, I got to know a family very well in the White Rock. And, uh, you know, it was letting them have photographs of the baby when it was born, and they were interested <coughs> in, in its progress. Uh, and then all of a sudden, a knife cutting it off, mm. that you couldn't go back and they didn't want to see you. Mm. Uh, and consequently, you know, you, with progressive tours, you, you sort of understand and you, you hear about members of that family ending up in the H block and on the blanket yes. uh, and, and, and finally being a hunger striker. Yes. I married a girl, as you all know, from Northern Ireland and um, from the day that we got married and left and she's never been back and never been allowed back mm. because she comes from an area where, where there has been trouble. Um, it's unbelievable to think that in the United Kingdom she cannot get on a plane and go and see her own family. But she down when three young Scottish soldiers, 17 years old, were killed indiscriminately. Uh, I think, personally, I can speak for the army now when mm. I say that the whole of them uh, changed their attitude completely, and yes. that was the change. Yes. And from then on, it was uh, murder after murder. Indeed. Outrage after outrage. Outrage. You, you, you yes. There was a that spiraling. The that you, had, you had thought were, were friends or acquaintances you had known and given you comfort on the streets when it was wet and cold and raining, then you couldn't wanted to them. kill you. Yeah. The you door was closed them. in your face. Yes. Uh, and, you know, you had nowhere to go then but the streets and the street corners uh, and look after them. I don't, what we... I don't really have no option today. I mean, all these lovely people that fed us with tea and soup and all that, they lived in areas where the IRA had finally taken over, they were finally ready to make their move. And the question was, you support us, you get out, or well, we'll put you out. This was it. I mean, this was the so, law of the I mean, gunman taking over. I mean, because the gunman wasn't just against the door us, to the British he was Army. against the civilian that shot. was giving us tea. There would be a knock on the door. Yeah. yeah. They didn't Don't give the Brits any more tea. Conform. Yeah. OK, listen in. We're moving out today, five brick multiple, group one, Lima and Echo. OK? Group two... Alpha, Charlie and Delta. Group one is going out of the back way and I want you to go down Echo and go firm on the barriers while we move through you. OK? We'll go down into the area of the rocks and we'll go firm there. Whilst Alpha, Charlie and Delta, I want you down onto the Falls Road. OK? Remember the threat on the Falls Road of the RPG attack on mobiles and there will be some passing your way. I want you to take the area of the corner of the Falls Road there where the last bomb went off 
Okay, and go firm there. Remember the very dangerous area around the front attack on the Springfield Road. Right, we've had several attacks there in the not too distant past. Remember they're high risk areas and there have been a, a lack of people that we know in this area. Right, a lack of the local players. Just remember that as we go out. Are there any questions? All right, we're going to move out, start kitting up, and we'll be out at the loading bay in 10 minutes. Let's go. Four inspection, four arms. East Springs. Dress off. bottles coming in, a hail of bottles, and the splinter of glass going in the, the, the co-passenger's eye, yeah. and he lost the sight of his eye, yeah. and a 12-year-old threw the bottle. Yeah. They're bloody awful things to drive, though. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the graffiti yeah. now. Yeah. Is this the back end of Springfield Road? Yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah. You used to call Springfield yeah. Barracks. Yeah. 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 That's right. Do you remember there was a... A sergeant killed in it, died on a bomb when we were in Liverpool. Oh, yeah, that was oh, it's yeah, safe, it's a lot of all the civilians were in there. No, there was, it was a para. That's right. I knew it. Sergeant Willis. He was, uh, they, threw the, they threw the case into the front door of Springfield yeah. Road Police yeah. Station yeah. and he shielded his, uh, some children. This junction down here, this Falls Grosvenor Road junction, makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up yeah. within a 500 metre radius of there. Do you think they've ever realised just what um, the, the soldiers wanted to went through? Yeah. I mean, we were yeah. up here. I mean, we, we, we didn't have time really to think about it. Oh, no. the girls, they were back there. Yeah. They saw what was on television. I mean, they, they only ever saw the highlights anyway. The highlights oh, of the violence, yeah. yeah. But again, they didn't. And they saw, you know, they there was thought, such good media cover of the violence that it was on the television every news. That's right. And it was at what 70, 1970, it, it changed, and now we're hated. Yes, yeah. they it's just don't want us. Are you looking for known faces? Uh, Are you able to do all that? known faces, yeah. We're yeah. taught on terrorist recognition, uh, we look for known faces that are pointed out to us by our end, and also ones we don't know, they're the ones that we need. So you're here assisting the police as opposed to when we're here, the police assisting us? That's right, well, on my very first tour, I think I saw one policeman on the whole tour, and yeah. you know, that was in the police station. Yeah, yeah. Whereas here, they're all over the place, yeah. and we just try and keep in the background. Yeah. I, I feel that they should be doing the job totally, and they should be armed to do it, and the, the army should get on with what armies are meant to do, which is proper fighting and not, not sort of half and half police work. It's, they, I think the IC needs to be armed a bit more and a bit more... I don't know, this should be more of them, that's the but thing. It's it's just, just, why, why, do say, why do you say that? Surely you must relate to the British policeman who is unarmed and does yes, uh, a super efficient job. Uh, but you don't have um, the amount of terrorist organisations or uh, anti-feeling in England. You just ah. don't have the same sort of atmosphere sure. as you get here. You can, if you just stop these guys walking down here now, really, if they, if they talk to us at all, it'd be a miracle. Yes. They yeah, just are anti.
Costi. Costi, yeah, yes. Standing right in the in the middle of a superb shoot, if anybody wants, right. you know. And, and again, I get this prickly feeling, you know. And it doesn't really bother me. Although um, places like the Bally Murphy, where I did have it hard, I would probably feel the same as you did. But here, yeah. I never remember this place to be violent towards me. Never. The last time I stood on this part of the Falls Road, I was shot at. I'm a little bit worried about it at the moment this time as well. Crossing a street, can't you, really? Protestant, Catholic, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. The majority of people yeah, downtown yeah. don't want troops, and they don't want police, and they don't want anything to do with Britain. And it's only the fact that it's, this area is stuck in the middle of places that do want to be part of Britain that it's, it wouldn't, it's not part of the South. Or, that's what I think, because they just don't want to be part of you know, what's going on here. We're soldiers. We're, we're trained. You're supposed to fight a war against uniformed people. You never, yeah, you yeah. never really know who your enemy are here. I mean, you've got to treat virtually everyone as your enemy, even the most friendly people that come up and they chat to you and talk to you. Always in the back of your mind, you're thinking, are they after something? So you're, I've got to watch what I say. Well, the British Army do tours and they go away and they have a break and they get refreshed. But the people who live in these huge Roman Catholic estates, Ballymurphy, White Rock, Turf Lodge, Beachman, they've had to have their whole way of life eroded by this situation, in a situation where they have very little control over what is happening. They're victims of the emergency. Whether it's all been worthwhile, one becomes increasingly concerned about. And looking now at still a high rate of hard military patrolling, I wonder if it's really justified, but also whether it's rewarding to the soldiers doing it year after year after year. I think the British would like to care about Ireland. What bothers me a lot is that there are no great steps being forward, no, there's no boldness, no vision, uh, constitutionally, politically, uh, and the soldier goes on holding the ring. I don't believe that the military presence is going to contribute a great deal except to provide targets and to act as a justification for some Republican activity. A military man's normal instinct is to get stuck in, you know, bags of initiative, sort the place out um, within the bounds of reason. Whereas here, I have to tread a very careful line and in trying to return Belfast to normality and support the IUC in the maintenance of law and order, you obviously have to rein back. And you can't go thundering in a bit like a bull in a china shop. You've got to think, well, is that going to contribute to the long-term aim of returning to normality? If it's not, then you obviously have to think long and hard about whether you want to do it. The depressing thing is that we're still here. Uh, when I first came here 12 years ago, if you told me I'd be here uh, 12 years later, I'd have said you were wrong. Um, stark staring bonkers, as they would say. Everybody down there, will you? He's taking his kit out of the wagon now. The wheel brown's coming out the back of that first aid wagon. Can you tell me what the target is, please? The, the what target. What, what was the target? What's, what's actually in there? It's an Agrilox shop's 
Hardware shop. It's, oh, it's just a commercial premises then. It's it's nothing special. I don't know. Yeah. This type of bombing would a soldier would be very careful because the first bomb would draw you in, and this then the, a, the second yeah. one would catch you as you were doing someone, and the third one would have a double at the ATO. You know, the type of bomb uh, seems to be one that we came across a lot in the past, probably gel ignite and petrol, uh, designed to do the most damage. bomb started a fire, but firemen couldn't move in because of the second device. An eyewitness said the bombers didn't shout a warning, and the alarm was raised by a member of the Electrolux staff who saw a white plastic bag with wires coming out of it lying beside the counter. Eight people were working in the building, but he escaped without injury, while police began evacuating offices nearby. Fifteen years ago, a, a device like that would have brought the whole of Belfast city centre to a complete standstill. I mean, when we arrived, on the far side of, of the city hall, the traffic was riding, running as normal, and you know, two streets away from where we were standing, Belfast was going about its daily business still. Up till now, we'd patrolled this area, we knew the people, yes. we'd had no, nothing but friendship and cups of tea and we've seen really as protectors after all the offense the Protest, extreme protestant offensive against the catholic people but this night which must have been march the 31st 1970 it was the turning point really we were brigade reserve company and during the day there'd been a orange march along the end of the road there and we were deployed towards midnight to reinforce the scottish battalion that was up holding this area and was coming under stone throwing attacks from the Catholics and we came up the White Rock Road and were met by a hail of rocks onto the uh, side of the Land Rovers and the vehicles we were travelling in. I think from then on we knew that the, the honeymoon period between the British Army and the Catholic community had ended and from then on we could expect more nights like this. The initial reception we had here was of, an, of, of an, an army coming in as a force for good. And here we are now, an army greeted with hostility, sullen resentment. They don't want the army here at all. They all stopped here, the that's Saracens, and we right. got it. That's right. We were the soldiers in those Saracens. You were? Yeah. Fifteen years. Well, you should have been ashamed of yourself. Well, we were trying to... No, you weren't trying. Yes, we're good to us at first, and then you turned against us. Well, do you think that was our wish to do that? We came initially to help you. It was the British you. government's wish. Well, I think that's probably right. But do you remember when Bombay Street was burned yeah. out and Cooper Street? But she's never done anything then. It was the RUC done yeah. that. We were sent to try and stop that happening up here. Mm -hmm. And then we couldn't see no reason why the local people should turn against us. Well, you were very kind to us in these houses. You gave Everybody us tea. Everybody here was. Yes, you gave Everybody us tea. Everybody and, and then you just turned against us. Well, I, I don't know why. Well, we wondered why we could come in for, say, six months as friends and then one night come in and get a hail of rocks and stones and bottles and iron railings and so on. We were, we were very confused at that well, you time. you see, there's good and bad everywhere, mister. We, 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 were all, we were all right here in 1968. But from 1966, it was Paisley started. Hello, David. Hi. Long time since we saw you. Is it Hello. Right. Come on. Must have been what? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. We've got wet coats, I'm afraid. Oh, not to worry. Yeah. What did... Uh, September 
69, first time we met. That's right, indeed. Yeah. yeah. And you were very much concerned with the Defence Committee. That's right, indeed. When we first met, uh, the IUC were... This was a no-go area, wasn't it, yeah. for, for regular right. policing? Um, the, uh, what do you think of the army being here now? We're, f we're certainly convinced that the British Army are here looking for a military victory. And there's no military victory to be had in this situation. They'll never learn. They've had experience in Aden, Cyprus, and Greece, and Palestine, throughout the world. And, well, we have now become a training ground for what's going to happen, perhaps, on the mainland in the future. Did you feel, when I was here with my company, that I was using Valley Murphy as a training ground, or that I didn't feel concerned for the people? No, what I would have thought at that time was the policy of the British Army hadn't been thought out. Mark, you were here whenever General Freeland said that the honeymoon period would be a very short-lived period. That was a threat. I mean, he wasn't making a prediction at all. He was threatening us. We were threatened to behave ourselves. What would happen tomorrow in Banny Murphy and White Rock and Turf Lodge if soldiers were removed totally, but some sort of security force, the IUC, was still needed in a normal policing role? The IUC will never be accepted in these areas. Never. When I go back, I'm going to say to Shirley, thank God I haven't got to go back there again. Because I reckon to do a, another military tour over here, under the present circumstances, would drive me up the wall. The thing I should remember is the dedication of the Republican we saw this afternoon. No wavering after 15 years of conflict on the streets. No. Same aims same intentions and the same dedication yes, and, commitment, and, and yes that's right and when you think that that has to be bypassed overcome or or, ma or, or, or shaped to good for the good of Ireland um, it's foolish to plan without taking a factor like that in, into consideration we have heard from both sides in the last five days while we've been here from from the Protestant and from the Re Republican their side of the story we have sat and we have listened but I really wonder, have they listened to our side, to the soldier's story, to the man who has been sent here because he is in the army, doing a job which he is paid for, and is here just doing what he's sent here to do, to keep peace? When we were on the Falls Road the other day, the crowd began to move away. And do you remember that in, in past days, that would have meant that there was something going to happen? Yeah, if you saw the local people moving, moving. the word had gone out. Yes. There was to be an incident. One of the things I used to think about was, I wonder, wonder what it's like to be shot, you know? We've had crack and thump demonstrations. Yes. Yeah, I'll put it there. Make your eyes water as well. Yeah. But I just, you know, but it was a thought, just momentarily, it used to cross my mind, mm. what it was like when that round enters your leg? Mm. I hope it's not my heart, or yeah, somewhere yeah, more yeah, vital, yeah. you know. The working classes of the Shankill started off by taking on the working classes of the Roman Catholic areas. And who came in to separate them? But work soldiers from working class areas yeah. of Britain. Yeah. physically separate people, because the more barriers you build, the more you separate, yeah. not the less. Berlin really was a fallacy when you look at it. Look at the street. The streets themselves tell their own story. But the height of this, right down here, it's almost as though they don't want the people in the upper, in their bedrooms, on the Protestant side, yeah. to have any contact at all yeah. with their neighbours, who are only, what, 
50, 80 yards apart. Yeah. I see that like, like a giant knife. I mean, a city is created by its people. And what they're doing, they're carving them right down through the middle. Yes. With a giant knife that nobody's prepared to move. Nobody's taken a step forward. They've decided, well, we've gone far enough. We are going to stay here. Yes. We will put a wall up. They can't come to us, and we can't go to them. So where are they going to go from here? I noticed, I don't know whether it means anything at all, but you notice there's a wide area with no houses now. Yeah. As if there's a wall and neutral ground before you start rebuilding the community. So Add the minefields and the dogs and you've got East yeah, Germany. That's that's right. Right. There you, you, you've got this division between a political division, but here it's a division caused by bigotry yes. and hatred. Your immediate reaction is, you know, that both sides keep talking about peace and unity, yet they, they, you know, they both want the wall to stay where it is. Neither side wants to have the wall taken down. I don't know if it's, uh, it's all been worthwhile. To be honest with you, I don't think it was. I don't think the hours and hours of time we put in patrolling, working here, trying to win the hearts and minds, I don't think it was worth it, personally. World.